Hi. The topic of today's program is about the sexual reproductive system of flowering plant. Okay, let's have an overview of what we are going to learn today. First, we need to understand that in flowering plants, flowers form the reproductive system of the plant. Therefore, we need to study the detailed structure of a flowering plant, the flower in particular and the types of flowers. We will examine from which part of the flower pollen grains come from and look at the process of pollination. Next, we will look at the development of fruits and seeds in plants. We will also examine the physical changes of seedlings during germination, that is epigeal and hypogeal germination. We will also conduct an experiment to study the conditions required for germination of seeds. Then, we will look in detail at vegetative reproduction in flowering plants. Okay, let's now look at the structure of a flowering plant. Flowers are the sexual reproductive organs of plants. A typical flower consists of the sepals, petals, stamens and pistil, which are arranged in walls or rings at the end of a flower stalk. The outermost part of the flower is the sepal. The sepal is usually small, green and leaf-like and it protects the flower during the bud stage. The petals, that is the second outer part of the rings, may be coloured, scented and sometimes fused into a tube. It will usually attract insects and animals because of its colours and scents. The petals protect the stamen and pistil at the bud stage. The male part of the flower is called the stamen. Each stamen consists of an anther at the end of a stalk-like filament. The anther produces pollen grains which in turn produce the male gametes. Whereas the female reproductive organs of a flower is the pistil. Most flowers have only one pistil. The pistil consists of a stigma, style, ovary and ovules. The stigma has a sticky surface to enable pollen grains to stick on it. The style connects the stigma to the ovary so that fertilization can take place. The ovary is the enlarged part of the pistil, which is like a sac filled with ovules. It contains the female gamete. There are two types of flowers, bisexual and unisexual flowers. Unisexual flowers contain either the stamens, which is the male reproductive part, or pistils, which is the female reproductive part. Examples of these are papaya and maize. Whereas the bisexual flowers will contain both the stamen and pistil, like hibiscus, morning glory, and flame of the forest. The stamen consists of the filament and anther. The anther consists of a sac containing pollen grains. The pollen grains come in various shapes and sizes. Some have rough surfaces which make it easier to stick on the stigma. For sexual reproduction to occur in flowering plants, the pollen must first reach the stigma. The process of transferring ripe pollen from the anther to the stigma is called pollination. Pollination plays an important role in enabling the male gamete sent by the pollen tube to fuse with the ovules in the ovary. Flowers can only pollinate in two ways, either through self-pollination or cross-pollination. Self-pollination occurs when the pollen grains 
are transferred from one anther to the stigma of the same flower or another flower on the same plant. Self-pollination has its weaknesses. The new plant has the same characteristic as the parent plant, but the resistance against disease is lower for the new plant. It will also result in less variety in new plants. For self-pollination to occur in the same flower, both the anther and stigma must mature at the same time. If it involves two flowers, the anther and stigma can mature at different times. On the other hand, cross-pollination occurs when the pollen grains are transferred from one anther to the stigma of a flower of another plant of the same species. The anther and stigma can mature at different times for cross-pollination to occur. Cross-pollination also results in more variety in new plants, more resistance against diseases, and the quality of plants will also improve. In the field of agriculture, cross-pollination has been used to increase quality of our agricultural product. For example, in oil palm, cross-pollination between Piscifera and Dura type has produced the Pinera type, which has a thin outer covering and produces more oil. A cross between Mexican maize and Taiwanese maize led to the golden honey maize, which has a larger cob, shorter ripening period, and is more resistant against diseases affecting the leaves. Another example is the Exotica Malaysia papaya species, which is extremely sweet and exportable. Normally, the application of cross-pollination in agriculture has more advantages towards improving the quality and quantity of fruits and seeds, more adaptability to the environment, and it is more resistant to diseases. Pollen grains cannot move independently from anther to stigma. For pollination to occur, the plant needs an agent to do the job. There are various types of pollinating agents, be it wind, insect, animal, or water. But the chief agents of pollination are wind and insect. The structure and characteristic of an insect pollinated flower and wind pollinated flower varies. For wind pollinated flowers, the flowers are usually small, pale colored, not scented, and have no nectar. They have long filaments so that pollen will be easily exposed to the wind. They produce a lot of small, light, and smooth pollens so that it can be easily carried by the wind. The styles and stigmas are long and feathery, so it can trap the pollens carried by the wind. Examples of this type of flowers are maize, paddy, sugarcane, and grass plants. For an insect pollinated flower, the flower is usually big, colorful, scented, and there are nectar present. Insects will be attracted by these characteristics. When the insect lands on the flower to suck nectar, pollen grains will stick to the hairy legs and body of the insect. Then, the insect will carry the pollen grain and stick it on the stigma when it lands on another flower. Insect pollinated flowers also normally will have short filaments and small anthers at the end. The pollen grains are normally not much. They are big, rough and sticky. The styles are short and the stigma has a sticky surface. Examples of this type of flowers are hibiscus flower, sunflower, rambutan and durian tree flowers. Plants that float or are immersed in water, they release their pollen grains on the surface of the water or into the water. To 
water will carry the grains to the stigma of the flower. Flowers pollinated by water will usually have plenty of grains, light, waterproof, small in size, no fragrance, no color and nectar. Next, we will look at the development of fruits and seeds in plants. After a pollen grain falls on the stigma of the flower, the stigma will produce a sticky, sugary liquid. This liquid will be absorbed by the pollen grain and germinates a pollen tube. This tube will grow through the style towards the ovary. In the meantime, male gametes will develop in the pollen tube. When it reaches the ovary, the pollen tube will burst and release the male gametes. One of the gametes will then fertilize with the female gamete in the ovule to form a zygote. After that, the zygote will undergo cell division and grow to form an embryo. The ovule will develop into a seed while the ovary will develop into a fruit. After fertilization, the sepals, petals and stamens wither and fall off because these parts are no longer needed. Seeds may differ in size, shape and colour, but the basic parts are the same. A seed is made up of an embryo, a food store and a protective seed coat or testa. The embryo consists of the plumule and the radicale. The plumule will develop into a new shoot, whereas the radicale develops into a new root. Cotyledon is a food store that supplies food to the embryo during germination. That is, before the first green leaf grows to produce its own food by photosynthesis. Testa is the seed's coat which will protect the parts in the seed. Hilum is the place where the seed is attached to the fruit and it is part of the seed coat. On the seed coat, there is a small hole that allows water and air to enter the seed. This is called the micropyle. There are two types of germination, epigeal and hypogeal germination. Epigeal germination occurs when the cotyledons grow above the ground as the shoot grows. Plants that undergo epigeal germination include sunflower, groundnut, long beans and kidney beans. Hypogeal germination occurs when the cotyledons grow underground as in plants like maize, paddy, rubber trees, coconut and rambutan trees. In this experiment, we need to have boiling tubes, cotton wool, water, paraffin oil, green beans, and refrigerator. We will use four boiling tubes to study these cases. In tube A, we will put a seed wrapped in moist cotton wool and kept at room temperature. In tube B, the seed will be wrapped inside dry cotton and we'll leave it at room temperature. For tube C, the seed will be soaked in a mixture of boiling water and paraffin oil and kept at room temperature.
In the last tube D, we will wrap the seed in moist cotton wool and it will be kept at temperature of 3 degrees Celsius. Therefore, from this experiment, we can see that the seed in tube A only germinates. In tube B, the seed cannot germinate because there is no water. In tube C, boiled water does not contain dissolved air and paraffin oil prevents air from dissolving in water. That is why the seed in here failed to germinate. As for the seed in tube D, the temperature is too cold for the seed to germinate. From these experiments, we can confirm that the seed can germinate if there is presence of water, oxygen and suitable temperature. Seeds germinate best at 25 degrees to 30 degrees Celsius. Now, apart from sexual reproduction, Many flowering plants can reproduce using certain parts of a plant like the rhizome, bulb, palms, stem tubers, leaves, runners and suckers. This type of reproduction requires only one parent plant. This is called vegetative reproduction. Vegetative reproduction is a type of asexual reproduction that produces a new plant from a certain part of the parent plant other than the flower. The vegetative parts can reproduce asexually when separated from its parent because these parts contain stored food and buds. One of the various techniques of vegetative reproduction is marketing. Layering is also another form of marketing. The young plants are exactly like the parent because they have the same genetic material. Examples of plants that reproduce vegetatively are ginger and lalang, which reproduce through rhizomes, potato through tuber, tapioca and sugarcane through stem, grass and Indian pennyworth through runners, shallot through bulb, yam through combs, aloe vera through leaves, and banana tree and bamboo tree through suckers. There are lots of research related to vegetative reproduction in agriculture being carried out by various private and government agencies like Mardi, Malaysian Palm Oil Board, and various plantation companies. Vegetative reproduction is being used to produce new varieties of crops and to improve the quality and quantity of the plants. Stem cuttings have been used for a very long time. However, with the advancement in science and technology, the methods are now improved to produce faster and better results. Plants like tapioca, rose plants, and hibiscus plants can be reproduced in this way. Tissue culture, an example of biotechnology, is used to produce new plants from tissues instead of from the bud of a parent plant. This technique produces plenty of new plants in a short time. It does not take up a lot of space and can be carried out throughout the year. The young plant is called a clone and is genetically like the parent. Every individual plant has genes in the cells. These genes decide the characteristics of the plant. Research has enabled scientists to change the genes in certain plants to obtain new genetically modified plants with the desired characteristics. Genetically modified crops mature early, produce more quality and quantity, and are more resistant to diseases and drought. Okay, let's recap what we have learned so far. Number one, the flower is the sexual reproductive organ in plants. Number two, the stamen is the male reproductive organ in the flower. The filament supports the anther. 
the male gametes are contained in the pollen grains. Number three, the pistil is the female reproductive organ. It consists of the stigma, style, ovary, and ovules. The ovules are the female gametes in the ovaries. Number four, pollination is the process of transferring pollen grains from the anther to the stigma of a flower. Number five, self-pollination takes place when pollen from the anther of one flower is transferred to the stigma of the same flower or another flower on the same plant. Number six, cross-pollination takes place when pollen is transferred from the anther to the stigma of a flower on a different plant but of the same species. Number seven, insects, animals, wind and water are pollinating agents. Number eight, fertilization in flowering plants takes place inside the ovule. Nine, after fertilization, the ovules develop into the seeds, the ovary into the fruit, and the zygote into the embryo. Number 10. Germination is the process in which the embryo grows into a new plant. Number 11. Germination of seeds require water, oxygen, and suitable temperature. Number 12. Vegetative reproduction is a form of asexual reproduction where a new plant is produced from the vegetative parts of the plant. Number 13. The vegetative part is the part that reproduces. Examples are leaves, stems and roots. Number 14. Vegetative reproduction is applied in agricultural research to increase crop production. And number 15. Tissue culture is a biotechnology technique used to produce new plants using tissues from the parent plant. Understanding the sexual reproductive system of flowering plants can only serve to enhance a student's appreciation of the complexity and beauty of life.